Um, you can turn your videos off if you don't want to be seen, that's fine, up to you. I just want to formally welcome everyone to tonight's webinar on trout. This is the basic trout talk. We'll also be having a second one in to do more intermediate advanced. Um, but I'd like to, to introduce our hosts tonight. We've got Joe. So Joe, do you want to introduce yourself and say a few words first? Hi, uh, thanks, Nikki. I'm Joe Dobson, yes, and thanks. together. Oh, sorry, can I just ask if you be able to mute your mics? Yeah, I might be able to mute. Just mute yourselves. Sorry, guys. All right, Joe, go for it. Oh, cool. sorry. Hi. So I'm Joe Dobson, and together with my husband Rick, we own uh, a tackle store, Aussie Angler. We've been there for 32 years. So for uh, 30 years. Uh, we've been fishing together uh, all around Australia and the world, uh, chasing primarily trout, but also all sorts of other species. Um, and, uh, you know, everything in between. Uh, we're very passionate about trout, particularly here in Australia. And uh, we love to share knowledge. And it's great to see everybody wanting to learn uh, more about our species here. Yeah, it's definitely an iconic, um, especially in this part of the world, the trout fishing. Um, and I'd also like to welcome Cleola. You want to give a bit of an intro, Cleola? I'll pass across. Thanks, Nikki. Hi, everyone. I'm Cleola Andrews. Um, I am, I, I consider myself, by comparison to Joe, relatively new to the fly fishing world. So I still consider myself in the, in the beginner group. <laughs> uh, but I have been fishing uh for probably over 40 years um in a range of marine and estuary fishing uh both uh in australia and around the world and i'm currently um the chair of the snobs creek hatchery perfect thank you cleola well we might kick off and um start the chat so uh who wants to go first joe or cleola do you want to kick us off Sure. Well, I, I think um, Cleola and I had a little chat, so uh, very informal. So I thought what maybe I might do is talk about the types of fishing that are successful for trout um, and the, the types, types in broad language of gear that you can use. So like most fishing, um, trout can be caught on lure, bait and fly. And uh, they're all fun. They're all successful and sometimes it's about applying the technique to the area or very importantly to what you want to get out of the day. Um, so say so let's start with some uh, bait fishing. We have basic um, trout bait is basically uh, worms, mealworm, you're inclined maggots, uh, particularly if you're a coarse angler, not a lot of that so much in Victoria, um, but very successful way of, of catching uh, fish. Then we have um, uh, lures being hard bodied. They float or sink different depths, just like your salt water stuff. Um, we have soft plastics. We have spinning style blades, um, and Casey Devil styles, you know, metal wobblers and things like that. Um, and I'll show you a couple of those and we'll get this started. I, I'm pretty confident that um, these will show up fairly easily. One of the things about lures is, particularly if you're fishing on your own or with children, it's really nice way to be reasonably active. So if you want to have a day where you're perhaps willing to walk upstream um, and you've got a, a partner, a, a friend, a child who wants to walk, then Lures can be really fun. And things like a Tazzy Devil spinning lure, traditional, are they coming up okay? Yeah, traditional little um, gold wobblers are fantastic, easy to cast, inexpensive, and super successful. And in fact, on a lot of our stocked trout lakes around Melbourne, um, these absolutely produce the goods, those stocked uh, trout, so they're really fun. Uh, most people have heard of a Rapala, and, and they're, they're a fun lure. They come in varying sizes, varying colors, and floating or sinking. And then we have lots of really lovely Australian lures as well, like this one. This is a bullet lure. Um, and I always chuckle because people say, what color catches? 
And I know for a fact, selling gear, that if there's one guy in a bank and he's caught a trout with a pink lure, the person next to him asked, heard that it was a pink lure, he's using one. 10 people up all heard it was a pink lure, they're all using one. Suddenly you've got groups of people hearing that somebody caught a fish on a particular colour lure, on a particular type of bait with a particular hook. And when you have huge amounts of people suddenly doing the same thing, you're going to have a pretty big success rate on those things. So I'm uh, a, a little less inclined to care about what people are telling me they're catching them on in terms of colour. Don't get me wrong, pink and fluoro colours are very popular, particularly with our rainbows. Um, and then rainbow trout coloured lures are very popular to catch brown trout. But um, I look at my boxes and I usually fly fish and I choose a colour of the day. I happen to like green, so I'll fish with green or some days I like silver. I'm not really complicated. Most of these things, if you get it in front of a trout, you're going to catch it. So lures catch fishermen as well as they catch fish. Um, but they are fun and 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 the aim of the game is having fun so lures are fun um the the other way to catch trout which is super successful whether it's bait or not is using a really basic size six or eight hook just a, a basic bait hook go into any of your local stores just ask the questions and trust what they're they're telling you um a basic bait hook if you're in a river, one of the better ways to fish it is with a sinker, just a really basic running rig. Fly line, or, or sorry, fishing line, monofilament, a ball sinker, a rubber stop, down to your hook. And the bigger the sinker, the better in running water, because when you have a small sinker in running water, it tends to get jammed up on the closest rock or the closest woody pile, and then you can't get it out. If you have a larger sinker, it will generally hit the water and sink in that spot. And also, if it's a sinker in which your line runs through, once the fish takes the bait, the line can pull through and the fish thinks it's free. It doesn't feel too much uh, resistance from the sinker. So um, fishing with worms and just a basic sinker is a really... Yes. Oops, sorry, that was my iPhone, um, my watch. It's a really successful way to um, uh, catch a trout, particularly with children, because it's easy. The best way to catch a trout with children, if any of you are wanting to fish with somebody who might not have the attention span because they're new or they're not loving it, and let's face it, that's a lot of people, if you're not walking and really active, use a float, whether it's one like this. If you're a saltwater angler and you've got garfish floats, that's fine too. Use any kind of float. That's a, a little clear bubble float. Um, floats with worms below are great to keep children's or adults' interest because you can watch the float. It's really hard to just watch a rod tip. It's not super exciting. Um, dough is really successful in impoundments and our stock lakes. I haven't really used it. I, I don't fish rivers with any of this kind of stuff but I'm sure that it would probably work and I'm not sure if anybody's done that. Um, I tend to be a very active angler and do a lot of walking since our children have grown up but certainly when our children were little um, I would use floats or if I was taking um, you know a grandparent or an older person or somebody who for some reason couldn't walk floats are fantastic uh, at doing that. Talking about rods and reels it's really simple. If you've got a rod and a reel and it's got monofilament on of any description or weight, to save you having to buy more gear, just run a lighter leader off it. Run a six or eight pound leader off whatever gear you've got. And it's going to, you don't do a lot of freshwater fishing, but you do a lot of salt and you've got that gear, that'll transfer. It's not a huge deal. Um, if you want to buy gear, then you're looking at a light all-rounder outfit of between six and seven foot long um, with a smallish, but doesn't have to be tiny reel. Trust 
the advice that you're given. If you want to fish with bait, um, a softish tip is good. And if you want to sleep lures, then a slightly stiffer tip is uh, really good for that. Now, those combos should start anywhere from $50 up to whatever you want to spend. Around $80 is going to put you in really good stead. You don't need braid or any of that kind of spiffy stuff. Keep it simple. Monofilament will do the job fantastically. The knots are easy to tie um, and it makes it affordable and fun. At the end of the day, I want my fishing to be fun. I don't care what I'm doing. It's meant to be enjoyable. It's meant to be simple. You want to make it hard, you can. That's up to you, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, probably one of the really important things that you need for trout fishing, of course, is a bank stick because you can put two rods out if you've got them and they're not going to fall in, they're not going to run off, it'll keep it safe. So they're a, a worthwhile investment. Um, you can also use, I just saw this float that I forgot, the old stick floats. Again, that's a, a real gar fishy float and they're super fun. Um, one of the things I used to fish with when we could get them and if you're around lakes and things is mud eyes below a float. I don't think it gets to be a lot more fun than a mud eye with no drag and you pop it out there and it's really, really light. And in that same vein, you can go into a fly store, again, just because that's sort of my passion, you put a fly below a float and have a really successful way of catching fish, almost like fly fishing and, and, and not quite bait fishing. And that's really successful. A lot of our waters, um, if you're in Northeast Victoria, you know, Eildon and the Pondage, that's a really great way to catch those fish um, cruising not too far off the edges. And, and getting good trout on a fly on the gear that you've got already, which is really, you know, worthwhile stuff. So we've just had a question. Can you explain what a mud eye is? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, a mud eye is a, a little live bug that um, is the larval stage of a dragonfly. So you can get them, um, you used to be able to buy them in stores readily. They're a little more problematic for us to get climate change, fluctuating water levels, all those sorts of things. They live on those um, strappy reeds that are in dams and you can often buy them in country stores for sure. And if you're keen and want to, you know, sink a net into some reeds, you'll get a few water spiders and quite a few mud eyes and they, they can be fun. You can get little um, rubber mud eyes and you can use mud eyes that are flies and they'll be super successful under a float as well. Um, they really look buggy and really look like a mud eye and, and um, the trout love them. And you can use those in all our waters. All of the lakes around Victoria uh, make for great uh, mud eye fishing. And again, if I was using just a mud eye rod, I'd probably choose a 13 foot long freshwater rod with a really light line. Uh, so if you had a surf rod, that would be a fantastic rod to use and wouldn't go astray. It would just be you know, you wouldn't be uh, fighting it with a really light rod. But you, I, I guess for me, you don't have to have dedicated gear. You can, you can adjust whatever it is that you've got and still have a really good time fishing and be successful at your fishing. So um, you don't have to get, you know, just trout gear. Um, and I just, I made a couple of quick notes that I didn't want to forget about. And I'll just make sure I'm covering those. Um, yeah, so think with, with my, uh, you know, six, eight or 10 pound. But again, if you've got saltwater gear that's heavier, just put a leader on it. Um, and that way you can get just a small amount from them. Keep it pretty simple. Um, worms, you can dig out of the garden, you can buy worms. Look locally wherever you're going to fish. One of the things that's really worthwhile getting to help you, there's a lot of information on the internet about uh, rigging and about where to go. But there are a couple of resources we've got here in Victoria. The FFA website and Fish Care have lots of resources around rigs and what to do. Um, one of the things you need to learn is about where to go. One of the greatest books that we've got is this. Um, so Inland Fishing Waters, the Fishing Atlas to Victorian Inland Waters. And most tackle stores will have it. Uh, it's a $30 book and it's got maps and names and quickly talks about all the fishable waters right around Victoria, whether it's lakes or 
um, rivers. And it's just a resource that's really hard to go by. Anywhere you go, if you have that, it's like having a mulways to our waterway. And then if you're wondering about uh, baits and rigs, again, there's another book which puts all your salt water and fresh water. You can say, I've got worms and look it up. You can look up, you know, this page here tells me all about garden worms, how to fish them, the depth to fish them and different ideas. So this book is called Baits and Rigs 2. And again, it's a Victorian production. Um, and it, it's got great illustrations by a, an artist, Trevor Hawkins, who's well known in the fishing world. Um, in fact, look, we've got our you know, a Wurf Lady Sky in the back. Um, so it's updated regularly uh, and it's, it just goes through everything from using grasshoppers to worms, um, freshwater yabbies, freshwater shrimp, cuttlefish crabs, cabbage, everything you could want in a bait for every kind of species, it's in there, gives you how to make all the rigs and how to do the knots. No affiliation, but it's lovely to have a resource that is worthwhile for everyone that works well. And that's one of those things that does that. So, um, Joe, jo, just on that note, we've had a question about um, a rig, so I might mention it now. What distance below a float would you put your hook, and does it depend on the depth of water? Um, in lakes, I, I think one of the things you've got to do with most species is, is be adaptive. So with um, fishing worms or power bait or a mud eye or maggots, whatever I'm using below a, a, a float, try and think about um, the time of year. So right now, water's pretty cold. Trout are tending to come up. They're following insect life rising to the surface. And so, and they do like it in that slightly warmish water when they're doing that. So they will tend to come to the surface. So you could, could try fishing maybe a metre under the water. And if that's not working, you might want to drop it a little, little longer, uh, depending on the water depth and the depth of the weed where you are. And so you might start fishing five metres off the bank at half a metre or, or, or 25 centimetres deep. And, and if you don't get anything within about 15 minutes, change it because it's not working. You need to go deeper and further out. And it's the same if you're in, in the river. If you're not getting something within, you know, 10, 15 minutes, change it up, move the spot, send it further, make it closer, um, make your sinker to, to hook connection a bit longer. You need to change because it's not working. They are constantly around. Um, they just have to see what you're presenting and you don't keep doing the same thing if it's not working because it's not working. Change it up. So no more than about 20 minutes if it's not working, think about how you can change it. As much as we like to say it's an easy sport, and it kind of is, it still does involve a certain amount of um, thought and definitely some lateral moving in, in where you are and where you're presenting it. Try and work out where in the water you're putting it, where in the water column, what might be on the bottom. You've just got to mix it up and, and sort of search for them and find them that way. Hmm. Good answer. All right, you can keep going. I was just, I was just reading them out as they come through. No, that's fine. Um, I think on on gear and sorry, Joe, I might have just accidentally muted you. Just come back on. Okay, really. Sorry, okay, yes. so on the top on the topic of um of sort of gear and and setting up, I might leave it there and let Cleola. Uh, present hers and then I'll come back and talk about the other thing that I'm passionate about which is caring for our trout and uh, ways we can do catch and release and maybe um, look after them uh, once we do catch them. Excellent all right Cleola we'll have you on and see if you can share your screen. Thanks Nikki. Ladies I have an unnatural love for power and also a very bad memory. So I have um, just got a couple of slides and I'm going to try and share the screen. Oh, host has disabled participant screen sharing. Um, okay, hang on. I'll just disable participant I'll just change something. Try it now. Yep, that's it. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. Can you something pop that up? Yep, we can see it. There we go. Yep. 
You're all right. Yep. Big screen. Excellent. So Joe and I are doing a bit of a tag team presentation and I'm going to talk about some areas of where to fish. And um, I feel like this is a, a somewhat unpaid advertisement for the VFA <laughs> website, but um, I have to sort of uh, probably extend a comment Joe made before about the really great resources that are there on the VFA website. And one of the, um, and I guess, Joe, this is probably the digital version of the book um, that you showed before, which is um, Inland Fishing Spots. And it really pays perhaps before you go out to do a little bit of homework to look at where you might want to actually go fishing and what the waters are like and what that might offer you before you actually head out there. So the really great thing with this um, uh, inland fishing spots uh, link uh, on the BFA website is that you can go in and start to essentially click through um, to the inland fishing spots and then a list basically of places comes up and as you click through you can get more detailed information so if you want to fish in the Goulburn region you know up comes the map and you can it's actually a, a really great interactive map that you can actually increase the size of and click on all the rivers and the really fantastic thing about this is that when you click on a particular river um, as you can see in this sort of fourth panel down the bottom it gives you a lot of really useful information so um, it will tell you you know where the river is but it'll also give you some information about the facilities um, that are near the river it tells you a lot about the water so you know in in this case um if you're on the Afron, you've got you know fast flowing water but it's fairly shallow it's about you know in certain places you're only fishing in about 30 centimeter riffles and um and the rapids so you're knowing already when you're thinking about gear to take this is not one where you're going to be you know throwing around um two flies with a giant nymph uh on the bottom uh with a tungsten bead on it that's going to drag you're wanting something fairly light weight it also gives you really informa um, information about um, the vegetation around there so on this one it talks about overhanging banks so if you're someone like me that's forever decorating trees with your back cast and your flies um you know you know this is probably not the river for you um or you need to change your casting style if you're fly fishing um on that river gentle ro roll casts and light pickups and lay downs are probably um, the way to go. And the other great thing is that it tells you about um, the fish that you will you can fish or you'll find in there. So, you know, here you've got some brown, brown trout, the occasional rainbow trout, apparently up to 450 grams. You'd be happy if you caught that one. Um, uh, but there are also some um, other species as well that you might see. So it's a really great source of information when you're thinking about going fishing to have, have a look um and see uh, the different rivers before you go there oh sorry gone too far so um rivers and lakes you're really spot by cho for choice in victoria in terms of rivers and lakes you can go um trout fishing in and this is just a very small selection um of what's available to you in the different um in the different regions and Central Highlands, you've got a range of really great um, uh, reservoirs and lakes that you can go to, including Hepburn Lagoon and um, uh, Lake Windaree. If you're heading out, if you live out west or you want to head out west, they've got Lake uh, Parampeet and Lake Fyans um, are really great. In the southwest, um, you've got the Mary River. And then, of course, in the north uh, and northeast, you can't go wrong on the Goulburn, um, uh, the Delatite, the Rubicon, and certainly the Stevensons if you're looking for, for trout. Um, I'd be interested to know, I don't really have uh, much experience in fishing the Gippsland area, but maybe some people online have some, um, some thoughts of some really great places that you all could share um, in fishing the Gippsland area. It's not, it's not uh, an area that I've gone to. Joe, I don't know. You might have a bit more experience in that. Sorry. Um, yes, and I'm going to say pretty much um, I haven't found a water that hasn't held a trout, to be brutally honest, uh, in nearly all the Gippsland Hill waterways. 
Uh, we do a lot of just exploring and walking and it's just hit a, hit a water and, and walk up it from a bridge and you will find a fish. It, it's that simple. So, um, and if you're actually city bound in Melbourne, uh, and especially with kids, there's some really great places that you can go fishing. And all of these are sort of stocked um, uh, lakes. And Caulfield Racecourse, Albert Park Lake and Ferntree Gully Quarry um, are really great places to start um, fishing. They're regularly stocked um, by uh, Snobs Creek. And Albert Park Lake, um, you'll often see uh, the big stonkers, uh, the big rainbow trout that go in there after they've been finished with it for breeding purposes at Snobs, um, they get taken down to Albert Park Lake. The really great thing about some of those places as well is that if you're taking the kids along with you um, and they're not really into fishing, you can take their bikes with them and they can ride around and give you some, <laughs> some peace and quiet to fish while they entertain themselves. And places like Albert Park Lake and Corfield Racecourse have those extra spaces around where the kids can kick a footy and entertain themselves if they get a bit bored with the with the fishing as well. So they're really great, great places to start where you can take the family and, and picnic uh, and keep the kids otherwise entertained when they get a bit tired of the fishing. Um, in the northeast, really, um, the high river countries um, hold some naturally sporting uh, brown and rainbow trout. Um, and they can be really fun to catch. Um, the spots probably to try um, if you want to go out there is the um, the upper Yarra and the Golden River catchments, um, the ovens and the King Rivers, um, you know, beautiful fish in, in all of those areas and the Nariel and the Upper Murray um, River catchment streams as well. The Midder Midder is also really well regarded um, in terms of um, its trout fishing. And the other thing is any really cold, clear water creeks that flow into those systems um, are also likely to hold fish. And sometimes just walking up those little side um, streams and creeks, you'd be surprised what you can find up them and go off the beaten path as well. Um, and the best time is really try sort of at either end of the close of the opening and closing of the season. They're a little less hounded at that time and it might um, increase, increase your chance of success as well. Um, and then I guess moving around Victoria in a bit of geography, you've got the Crater Lakes and um, as many of you will probably know, we've got some fairly unusual and unique volcanic Crater Lakes that are both really deep um, and fertile and produce some really big fish um, in some of them. And this is where um, I think the question before of how, how long do you go with you under your bubble float? You can go long <laughs> in some of these crater lakes. Um, and Will and Mary and Par and Pete are famous uh, for their big brown trophy uh, trout. And people are always um, on the lookout for those. And rumor has it, fish up to five kilos, you can get a big brownie out of there. So, you know, decent size fish in there. Um, also Rainbow and Chinooks um, you'll find in Parampeet. And I think we've just recently put um, a tiger trout um, in Parampeet as well. So that's something a little bit different um, to increase your range of uh, um, salmon that you might catch. Um, so what you probably make up for size, you lose in number perhaps uh, in some of these lakes. Um, and the big fish can be a little bit more cautious. They're big for a reason because they're kind of smart and cunning. <laughs> and so they may not be quite as easy to catch, but when you do get one, the size probably makes it fairly worthwhile. Um, and I guess to leverage what Joe was saying, if you're casting lures, you know, try it near the shorelines in the in the mornings and in the afternoons, and and work your way out. You'll find that they might come in cruising around the edges at that time to feed, and that might be um, some of your, uh, you know, some success to be had there. Um, but you can also deep trolling can work really well on the chinooks and the and the rainbows, um, and uh, you often have people out in boats. Uh, in some of those bigger crater lakes. In terms of Victoria's southern rivers, um, some of these coastal rivers are actually stocked um, annually. Um, and uh, the Hopkins, the Mary, um, they all have good fishing at times and sometimes have some sea runners um, in late winter and spring. 
Uh, again, you know, try casting some lures if you walk in the banks, if the water's dirty, um, or, tr you know, try and pull out the fly rod if it's a bit clearer and you can actually sight fish. I personally think there's nothing better than spotting a fish and actually trying, trying to cast to it and, like, and laying that fly directly in front of it. Sight fishing is lovely, but um, that's not always possible with the turbidity um, of water in different places. Um, and you've got other smaller coastal rivers as well um, around the Apollo Bay, Bay, uh, Bay area, and they turn on good fishing and may also produce some seasonal, um, occasional sea runs. So um, something to look out for. And then um, Western Lakes, you've got Tullerock, Tolondo, um, a number that are stocked and have good um, trout fishing, but it does, you know, you do have seasonal variations there. Um, the weather will obviously impact on the trout movements and they tend to head further upstream during the um, hot weather and probably because there's more shade and cooler water um, and they don't, trout generally don't do well in really warm water in the middle of summer. Um, Quill, we've just got a quick question just before you move on, just about sea runners. Do you want to explain what a sea run trout is? Oh, they're the trouts that go, well, theoretically go out to sea, but not all of them do that, but they may move out of the water into the into the wider estuary. Um, in some places, um, uh, including overseas, you'll actually get the trout that actually run out to sea to spawn and then, or, or, and then come back up the river to spawn, uh, sorry, go out and come back up the river to spawn. Um, uh, so what was I talking? Oh yes, light tackle um, in clear waters if you're sight fishing and casting. Um, and tiny soft plastic lures um, can often be successful. Uh, but um, as Joe said, some of the bigger fish will take those bigger uh, lures. Um, and if you like to, and you'll have the capacity and confidence to hike into um, upriver into some of those more remote sections, you might find some really interesting um, fish up there. But pay attention, you know, to the weather, the river and water levels is obviously um, incredibly important. Um, the other thing just to draw your attention to is, um, especially if you're taking the family out for the days, to check out the stocked um, waters and the VFA website keeps a, a, a fairly accurate and running tab on the waters that are being stocked and there's also the school holiday trout stockings and family fishing days and they're a really great way of um, getting the, the kids interested in fishing and actually trying your hand at, um, at catching some of those um, stocked trout as, as they go out so that's another really great resource and, um, and the website uh, link is up there. And I probably would feel remiss if I didn't just make sure that you all remembered to get your fishing licenses before you went out and do my due diligence. And also just be um, be wary of the closed season because you don't want to be um, in a river <laughs> and caught by uh, a VFA if, you're, if you are um, fishing at the wrong time. The other thing is that if you are fishing by yourself, um, in addition to your fishing gear and your outfit, it's really important to think about personal equipment, especially if you're going off the beaten track to some of the rivers and going um, up backcountry fishing. And you may want to consider if you're fishing alone and fishing in more remote areas, having a personal locator beacon in case you do get into trouble. And also having your phone, you know, in a waterproof container, handheld UHFs, all the safety devices, and of course, um, a first aid kit with compression bandages because none of us are looking for a snake. Uh, but if we find one, um, uh, unfortunately, it's always best to be really well prepared. So I feel like mother now because I've done the safety demonstration uh, part of the tour to make sure you're all safe and I won't feel guilty. <laughs> so I'll just hand back to Jo. I'll just stop sharing this one. I'd probably add to that, Cleola and our family, the jack jumper ants are the ones that cause the most uh, oh, yes. disaster with anaphylaxis. And so, you know, they're on everything and they're hard to watch. So it is worth maybe having some um, antihistamines and, and, a, and a smart head about you with that stuff. Good idea. Um, we've got another question. Uh, when new to river fishing, is there a river too small, shallow or running too quickly that should be avoided? I'll pass this one over to Mother or Joe. <laughs> um, 
you know, shallow meaning um, up to the knees can actually be ideal for some types of fishing, specifically fly fishing. Um, but if you're wanting to bait or lure fish, it's probably not the most successful water to be in. You're probably better off to be a little bit deeper, maybe knee deep to thigh deep and above. Um, water clarity doesn't matter so much. It is fun to Polaroid. If you are if you get yourself a cheap pair of Polaroids for trout fishing, um, brown, brown colour lenses give you the most contrast and the better ability to see fish. So it also is safe um, for hooks and things. Uh, so, and it will let you see underneath the water if you're walking up the stream and even on the side of the stream. So um, I don't, I think avoid those really shallow riffles that are only, you know, below the knees. I think for most, most of what you'll be doing um, knee depth and above, and particularly if you're using bait, um, the, the bigger pools are better or the bigger, deeper, slightly deeper areas. Um, probably leads into reading water. And, and as you get to be an angler, one of the things we do is really read water. Trout love um, cover. One of the things that we do, I'm, I'm also, and I, I didn't say this before, I'm a member of the Australian Trout Foundation. We do a lot of environmental work. Um, and I know we had a couple, we had um, Shaya Bloom on here earlier. She's been doing a, a lot of work up around Koryong to to do that, uh, to recover waterways. There's a lot of people who do a lot of efforts uh, to keep our wild trout fisheries going. And often what we do is a thing called uh, boulder seeding, planting boulders into waterways to provide um, uh, shelter for the fish. They like to sit, if the river's uh, flowing towards you, they'll often sit behind the rock uh, as the river's coming downstream. Uh, that's just a good place to look for fish. Um, anywhere where there's a little bit of structure uh, around logs and things, not so much like cod, you know, right deep in it, but, you know, fish have predators from above. Cormorants um, are a big one, so they like to be a little bit hidden. Undercut banks are often a really good place to find a trout. And under willow trees, if you're on the Goulburn or on, on um, even let's take an easy lake to get to Lake Wenderee, which is just firing at the moment. Believe it or not, it's in the middle of Ballarat. You can just drive up there, park on the edge, keep your door shut because those swans last time I was there were fairly nasty. Um, and, and cast a rod in and, and be very likely to get a fish out of Wenderee of, of a good size. Uh, and then you can go and have a latte when you've had enough. For a little bit and come back go by lunch it, it's a great way to fish uh but again under the underhanging trees uh and that when you think about it there's a lot of water life a lot of insects drop from trees not so much this time of year but certainly later in the season as it gets warmer uh trout come to the surface looking for things like beetles um and grasshoppers and spinners, and if it's in lakes, duns that are coming up. But there's a lot of ter terrestrial food dropping in, um, and and they love their food. At the end of the day, trout are they get spooky as the season gets later. So you know they're being caught. They're they're really leery of watching stuff. So if you approach a water, probably something that's worth thinking about is um, approach with caution don't trout will often be on the edges and on the margins of water whether it's a, a lake or a stream um, and they've got incredible vision they actually can see up quite high so when you're walking keep your rod tips down and try to and low on the horizon fish have this amazing ability to see straight up a bank and straight out of the lake and um and spot things and will spook so if you can sort of approach with care and uh you know one of the i i, I remember in tassie years ago uh, we met a man who would ask if we could he could fish with us for the day very nice fellow but by golly he had a vest full of gear that was all bright and shiny in the sun and uh, he had this massive you know, super expensive watch on that I'm fairly sure I could see from about a kilometre away. Uh, and let me tell you, the trout are going to see that too. So we politely asked him to take that off and, you know, put his gear and all his junk in his pockets so it wasn't glinting and shining and looking like a jeweler's shop. Uh, 
trout have an amazing ability to see things. But that being said, whether your fly or your lure is small or whether it's larger, if it's in front of them and they want to take it, they'll take it. it it's kind of as simple as that. Mm. Um, does that answer that question? I was probably long-winded then, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it does. We've actually got another question come through. What size hooks do you recommend uh, lure fishing? I find I have dropped a few. It could be that I'm using a, a hook that is too small. Is that possible, Joe? Or what would you recommend for lures? I don't know if you would change I, trebles to singles. Is that something you would recommend? Yeah, or? yeah I think if you can change um, trebles to singles, I think it's a good idea. There seems to be a really good hookup rate. One of the main reasons I think that is though, Cara, is because if you have a look at the single hooks, the point is longer um, and the barb is generally a little smaller than most of the traditional trebles. The barb's quite marked on a treble. It takes two to three times more force to get a barb to go through a trout jaw than what it does to get a barbless hook going through a trout jaw. The trick then becomes keeping a a fish on a barbless hook um, because they will tend to, you might drop some, but it's certainly far easier to do that. So I think if you can find a single hook that has a more open gape, you'll have more success than a treble with three hooks uh, on it. And I know you've got children and I know people new to fishing really need to watch this and that is barbs can be treacherous. So you can't squash a barb, but you can, if you have a pair of flat pliers, you can roll the hook and roll that barb down. And uh, it just makes for a safer day. It does make for better hookups um, and, it, and it will be easier. So hooks aren't hooks. You know, that's a whole topic we could go on for hours. Yeah, uh, yeah. And Joe, is it fair to say too, some of the lures um, that you get in the pack, some of the hooks aren't uh, the, the top of the line, would you say? Like, I know a yeah. lot of people tend to just remove them straight away and put a decent yeah. quality hook on. Yeah, and, and that, that sort of begs to the question of what type of, of lures you're using. So you can certainly buy, you know, dirt cheap lures, but they're probably going to have hooks that are not as sharp or that aren't shaped as well as we like. So you'll need to change those. And to do that, you're going to need split ring pliers, split rings and hooks. So economy probably doesn't work as well there. However, if you've not done a lot of lure casting, be prepared to lose a couple get the cheapest thing you can get and practice with it first. So that's not a bad thing. Lures like, um, you know, your Tassie Devils, your Rapalas, they have generally pretty good hooks on. Most of them use a VMC hook um, or a, look, lo lots of different brands of hooks, but most of them use fairly high quality hooks that are, that are quite good and more than good enough. Um, you do need to either sharpen them after a couple of years use or change them. Like anything else, you need to maintain gear. Uh, so talking about barbed or barbless hooks or treble hooks and single hooks, one of the ways we can help protect our fish um, is to think about using hooks without barbs or reducing the amount of hooks on there. I, I really don't love double trebles on lures. I just, I kind of cringe. I know they're needed. Um, I, I do like single hooks. Often people swap on a, on a lure, if I've got one here, if we're using a um, one of these lures, can you, yeah, you can see there's two hooks, one on the back here and one down below the belly. So often this one on the belly is changed, switched out for just a single hook and often the back ones are switched out. Sometimes people switch out both. Um, you know, I talk to any angler and there's gonna be 10 different theories on what hooks to switch out and why. Um, single hooks tend to get uh, hooked up less. If you're in weedy waters, the more hooks you have, the more weed you catch. Um, so again, if you can keep it simple, it works really well. Uh, I, so it does help to look after our trout uh, to have less hooks. So you can use even one like this, which is just, it's just sort of a, a little spinner. It's just got the one treble hook. They're super easy to cast um, and they do generally come out pretty easily. So you can roll those barbs on, on the hooks. I don't think we'll be able to see them, but there are little barbs there. You can roll the barbs down. Um, so you need a couple of things to be successful at fishing if you're going to go for trout. You'll need a net. 
you need to wet your hands. Don't handle trout or don't handle any of our fish really without wet hands because they have a protective coating. And once we handle them, um, we take away that slime and they're really at high risk of infection. So um, when you want to remove a, a hook, you're best to have a net. That way you can leave it. And I'm so sorry, I haven't got my video off my phone. I did one showing me hooking, uh, you know, landing a fish. And I, I put the net between my knees. The fish stays in the water the whole time. I wet my hands, pick up the fish, use a little pair of forceps or pliers, and you can get the hook out. Or if it's barbless, just take it out with your hands. If you want to keep the fish, that's great. Take it to the bank, knock it on the head fairly quickly. Otherwise, it stays in the water. You just release it. Um, and it's ready to swim another day. And believe it or not, Victoria has a really high um, amount of wild fish in our rivers. And if they're looked after, they can be caught time and time again. And it's wonderful. Like we are so lucky to have such a good resource um, with our wild trout fishery, mm. as well as our stock. So maybe stuff. we could share that video later on the Worth page just to give a bit of a demo on how you did that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'd love to do that. I'll just get someone slightly more technical than me to... Um, <laughs> to put yeah. that on no that's fine <laughs> i know we also mentioned too a lot of tips on with cod as well hold your breath for as long as you've got the fish out of the water if you do have to have out of the water just a good tip if, if you're running out of breath well then it probably needs to go back in the water um assuming you do want to release it so um do you want to mention too there's no actual minimum size for trout but i mean i guess most people i guess you would want to catch one what at least 30 centimeters i would say would that be about right, Joe? I mean, I don't think you keep many of them, do you? No. <laughs> um, but I, I guess the thing is, um, everyone's entitled to keep. We're allowed to keep fish. And if you're going to cook it and eat it, then take a fish that's pan sized. That's not an issue. Um, it's not a problem. And you're allowed to have, you know, most waters you can have at least two of those. Uh, and the idea is, you know, you can do that. It, when you get into smaller, tighter waters that perhaps have lesser populations of fish, you definitely don't want to be taking, you know, two each to every person all day, every day. It, it just becomes perhaps a little bit unsustainable. But, you know, just stick to the rules that are there. They're good rules. They're there for a reason. Um, and if you can keep to pan, pan sized fish, tend to taste nicer if you're wanting to eat. Um, a trout and and you know Cara's going to know more about that than than all of us put together with her cooking skills that's for sure <laughs> maybe you can tell us Cara what size would you prefer to um, cook and eat yeah definitely nothing under 30 I would say is a bit too fiddly and a bit tricky to get the flesh off yeah yep yeah well, um, is there anything else you want to add, Joe or Cleola? We're, we're doing pretty well. We'll go to Q and A soon, so if you can, people can start thinking of some questions to ask. But um, is there anything else you wanted to cover off? I think I'm done for the moment. I can't think of anything else that we need to. Just um, you know, lakes and rivers are slightly different. We've covered most of those topics. Um, you know, lakes are fun. Look for those trout stocked lakes uh, over the school holidays. Um, as a really good source of beginning, uh, you know, your trout journey as well. They're there for everyone and they are fun to catch. Yeah, good tip. Actually, we've got a question that's come through and this is actually one that we may not have specified. When you're casting lures in rivers and streams, do you mostly cast downstream and then retrieve them against the stream, the way the stream runs? Now, I, I, do you want to elaborate on what you would do when you fish, what, either Joe or Cleola? <laughs> Do you want me to do it, Cleola? Yep, I think she yep. wants <laughs> yeah. No, that's okay. Um, across and then downstream and retrieve. So as it goes across, um, it will naturally head downstream and then you'll keep retrieving as it's going. And, and the trick is to vary the retrieve speed. Um, don't keep it all at, at one speed. So vary it and maybe work the rod. And by working the rod, we mean work that rod tip a little uh, so that you might get a bit of a jerking motion in in that um, in the retrieve and in the lure. That's using, you know, a top water lure that you can see. And I think, you, you, you know, there's a lot of fun to be had by doing that and you can get um, uh, quite good at it. 
as they start to go down in the water, they get tricksy and you do tend to uh, hook a few things and, and get in a, in a little bit of, little bit of trouble. Um, as you fish across stream and down though, you want to be walking generally upstream. Yeah. So yeah, most of them will face upstream, won't they? Well, that's a food source. Yes. yes. Yeah. So they're waiting, they're watching the food come on by. Um, yeah. So they can pick just, out their tucker. You know, picking out and eating as it goes by. Oh, I'll have that. So yeah, yeah walking upstream is good. Um, probably actually on that, we should talk a little bit about stream etiquette because yep. that can be tricksy. Um, so if you turn up to the bridge and, and let's face it, and we're talking rivers now, not, not lakes, because you can find a, a, you know, camp out your spot on a lake, but on a river, um, you'll turn up to your access point, whether it's um, a bridge or uh, the end of a road. And if there's a couple of cars there in days gone by, there'd be little cards in the, you know, in the window that might say I'm fishing upstream, I'm fishing downstream. These, these days there's quite a, a few more people. And let's presume that most people might walk upstream, but the reality is plenty will walk down on the bank and then fish up as well. So if you can see people upstream of where you want to access, one good thing to do is to just go ahead and walk downstream off the bank as, as best you can and then fish up towards your car rather than fishing up from the car and then walking back. Um, and, you know, the, the rule of thumb generally is if you see someone in front of you, you know, 100 metres, 200 metres, hop out and walk quite a ways up. Give them another couple of hundred metres to fish uh, or even further, and then they will skip you as well. That you can, it's got to be fair. That's a good point. Um, great to touch on that, Joe. We've also got another question. Can you tell the difference between male and female rainbows and brown trout? Um, and what is the reproductive behavior slash season? Sure. Cleo, do you want to take that one? Just give me a um, Actually, uh, not, not necessarily readily can you tell the difference when they're juvenile um, uh, between the rainbows and the browns. The close season is when um, the native uh, trout are actually spawning. So that's the reason we have the close season is to actually protect that spawning time. And that's why it's really important to respect the spawning time um, and not fish during that close season because it's really um, important. You'll start to see um, towards the uh, towards the end of the uh, fishing season, you might start to see some of the, the behaviour of the trout changing. You'll see them starting to make um, the, you know, fluffing up the gravel, ready to lay, and you see those sorts of behaviours. My personal belief is that I don't fish for those. When you see that, I try and avoid that because they're starting to make their little, their little nests, as I call it, ready to spawn, and I try not to disturb them when they're trying to do that. So I think that's another thing sort of just to, to be aware of um, when you're fishing in the time of year and, and where you're going. Um, and I think that's the other thing is, um, Joe was talking about the fishing etiquette. Um, be, I guess the other thing just to add to that is, yes, it's really important to have that fishing etiquette, but also to have to be sort of a, what I call a conscious fisher person when you're walking the banks and crossing rivers and trying not to disturb um, crushing through the vegetation and, you know, um, tossing up the gravel as you walk uh, through riverbeds and things, because that's ultimately where they live, it's where their food source um, is. And you want to be as, I guess, careful and gentle as you can as you walk through that. I. I never cease to be surprised by the behaviour of people tramping through rivers and kicking up things and throwing cigarette butts on the side of the river. And it's just absolutely appalling, appalling really. And I think we just need to have, um, you know, make sure we have a high level of care for not just the river, but also the riparian verge where um, ultimately all the bugs and all the food source you know, fly into the water and feed those fish. So we just need to be really mindful of that as well. Mm. So yes. the, the, the male fella trout, is gen, as they get older, they tend to have a little bit more of a hook jaw. Hook jaw. You see the bottom jaw comes up. Um, 
not so much the uh, the hens tend to have a finer head and a little bit of a pointier jaw. Yeah. Um, again, as Cleola said, though, not young. Usually when they're older, you can start to pick them. When they're juvenile, it's a lot harder. Hmm. Joe, do you want to talk about, mention the um, Trout Foundation's tree planting days that they do as well? Yeah, sure. Um, so <clears throat> the Australian Trout Foundation are a, uh, a group of volunteers who, uh, geez, it's been going for probably 25 years. Um, and basically they do environmental works to benefit the habitat, um, which is our streams and the riparian stream sides, the vegetation uh, for our trout. So we work very closely with uh, volunteers from all sorts of clubs who are interested in trout and also um, with the VFA who do a lot of funding of the Australian Trout Foundation. Together with the VFA, we actually um, present the conference each year of Talk Wild Trout. Unfortunately, this year we couldn't do it um, due to COVID. So we'll probably be presenting early next year uh, if we can and if things settle down. So they they do do a lot of work on a website. It's an interesting uh, place to see some information about the uh, types of happenings that are on and you can also register um, to come and help along on tree planting days and things like that when we have them. So they're terrific ways of giving back and just ensuring the longevity of our, our trout fishing. Some people like to say that they're introduced um, species and thus shouldn't be there but I think like us they've been here for a fair while now 1863 so you know our trout are, are going strong and certainly provide um, some uh, social and economic and health benefits right across the board and and I think it's instrumental in providing environmental benefits to our waterways there's nothing keener on keeping our streams uh, healthy and safe than a, than a trout angler let me tell you they are all over the place um, you know, keeping their eyes on the health of the waterways. Probably unlike any other angler, I haven't seen anybody else care quite so passionately as a trout angler about their waterways. It does make me chuckle. Hmm. We've got a little ad from VFA that the Talk Wild the Trout... Number. There's a lot of foundations. ...going to be September 2022. Be. On that note, so... Well, I think they've postponed this one to next year, essentially. So yeah, um, yep. it's, it's a great hard. event too. So if, if those listening, try and get along to it. It's a very informative day. They normally have a, you know, a key speaker and yeah, it's a great day. Hmm. Yep. Have we got any other questions? You can either unmute yourself or you can just type it in the chat. Any other questions for the lovely host? We got a big thank you to, just so you know, that um, Mel said, thanks ladies for the wonderful information. Um, it's our pleasure to bring that to you. Um, is there any other questions on trout fishing that you might want to ask? No? Don't be shy. No, there's no silly questions. This is a talk about the basics, so you can definitely ask any question you like. Um, the only one, one thing that I just thought we might cover is just what gear would you take? If you're an absolute newbie, what should I be bringing along to the lake or river? Um, you touched on a net, Joe. Um, if you're going to kill one probably a priest so to speak or yeah you'll need something to knock it on the head with the fastest easiest most humane way to kill them is to really sharp tap to the top of the head yep. um yep. okay basics for taking in in a nutshell you'll need um apart from your own safety gear lunch and water you'll need uh, a light a light all round rod generally seven foot um, monofilament line, which is just regular fishing line, not braid or any of the other fancy stuff, just basic monofilament line, probably six to 10 pound. And um, you want to take, I personally, I'd start with worms um, over lures. I think, you know, using bait like worms is probably a lot easier to begin with. Um, and then you'll need, uh, you'll definitely need a, a pair of pliers or forceps to get the hook out of the fish's mouth. Their mouths can be quite bony, so it, it is hard to get them out. Um, so you do need a little pair of pliers just to pinch the hook and pull that out. Uh, and you'll need a net. Um, handheld dragged, you know, across the bank or over rocks or into the boat. I think a net is just a, you know, particularly if it's undersized or 
quite importantly, if it's a nice big brood fish that's meant to be there, if it's oversized, put them back. So keep them in the net, take that hook out while they're in the water. Um, we get photos of fish in the net these days in the water. We don't even take a lot of them out and then just put them back. So uh, if you do plan to keep a couple, just a plastic bag in your back pocket and then you can put that in your backpack or in the bag that you've got with you. You know, you don't have to go hawking buckets around and things like that. Um, I think that's probably your rod, rod, your bank stick holder. So a rod holder, if you're going to put the rod down at all, you'll need to have a little bank stick. You know, they're $7, so they're well worthwhile. Make sure you get one that actually holds a rod in it, not just leans on it, because that way it can't get caught on a snag and drag downstream or anything like that. Mm. That's about oh, that, it. I, so you'll need some sinkers. Yeah, sinkers and uh, valve tubing to hold the sinkers on or float stops, maybe a float. and. Uh, and a packet of hooks and and you know you can get all of that either in a little tackle kit or your store will be able to put all that together if you know ignoring the rod your terminal tackle will probably cost you you know twenty dollars yeah no drama well, that's great is there any other questions we've got before we tie up the end of this talk anyone else got any other questions Heidi said thank you so much ladies just as well um We'd really like to thank you on behalf of WORF for joining us. A really great talk. I really appreciate the effort you both put into your presentations and I hope all the viewers got something out of it. Um, we will share this video too. That way we can share it to a few more people that maybe weren't able to make it. So um, just thank you both and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, unless we've got anything else to say, everyone's saying thank you, very interesting. So you got a lot of love on the chat line. That's very sweet. Um, you can always write a question on the WORF page too. If you can't think of it right now and you want to ask something later, um, one of us will be able to help you. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, and just a little tie over, we do have another session that will be on intermediate slash advanced trout fishing, most likely next Wednesday. So if you like this talk and you want a little bit more detail, that's the talk to come along to. Um, if you're just starting out, you might want to listen in or you've happy with the knowledge you've learned today. So thank you all for joining us. And if you've got anything else, just join us on the WORF page. Thanks. That's it, everyone. Thank you Thanks, so everyone. Much.